Welcome everyone to our third session, Veterans as Civic Leaders. We will now hear from the leaders of several exceptional organizations that were established to connect veterans to opportunities for civic engagement, as defined as continued service to community and country. This session will be moderated by Marcus Ruzek, the Senior Program Director at the Marcus Foundation. Marcus is a decorated combat veteran who served in the US Army for 13 years as an Army Special Forces officer. Today, he oversees the foundation's military, veterans, and free enterprise programs. We're also joined by Mike Irwin, who served on active duty for 13 years during three deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. While earning his degree in positive psychology and, and leadership, Mike founded Team Red, White, and Blue in 2010, whose mission is to enrich the lives of American veterans. This incredible organization delivers local, consistent, and inclusive opportunities for veterans and the community to connect through physical and social activity. We're also joined by Amy Looney, who is the vice president of the Travis Mannion Foundation a foundation committed to empowering veterans and families of fallen to foster the next generation of leaders. The foundation is also dedicated to uniting communities in order to strengthen our national character. And finally, we're, we're here with Art De La Cruz, who is the president and COO of Team Rubicon. After serving 22 years as a Naval, US Naval officer, Art served as the director of strategic planning at Northrop Grumman. Team Rubicon serves communities by mobilizing veterans to continue their service, leveraging their skills and experience to help people and people prepare, respond and recover from disasters and humanitarian crises. So we're so grateful for this session. Before I yield to Marcus, please remember to use the Q&A feature if you have any questions. Marcus, welcome and thank you for joining us for this session. Thank you, Catherine. We're really excited to uh, start this conversation and um, talk to these great panelists. So uh, I uh, actually had the privilege this morning of speaking briefly to my uh, my children, their homeschool co-op, and I talked to their group about Veterans Day and what it means to be a veteran and the importance of uh, remembering those who serve our country. And uh, I surprisingly got a little choked up in that. So I'm going to do the best I can to not cry during this panel, but I think uh, we'll let the panelists do most of the talking and um, and, and really look at What's important today, you know, as we talk about veterans as civic leaders. Uh, so what I'd like to do first is let's go around and, and allow each panelist. It, Catherine gave a great introduction. I'd love for each of you to kind of take a few minutes and tell the story of your organization. How did Red, White, and Blue, Team Rubicon, Travis Mannion Foundation come to be? I think it would really just be a great place to begin on where did your journey start? So let's start with uh, Amy. How about you uh, kick us off? Yeah, thank you so much, Marcus. Um, uh, just really honored um, to be here and, and sharing more about the work that we do. You know, the foundation actually started in um, 2007 and it was started after the death of First Lieutenant Travis Mannion. Uh, Travis served in the Marine Corps and was killed in action in Iraq. Um, his family, along like many of our nation's Gold Star families, um, like myself, they wanted to ensure that his legacy lived on through the words that he spoke after before he left for his last and final deployment. And those words are, if not me, then who? And I think that those words really embody um, the men and women that have chosen to serve in the military and continue to serve. You know, I look at where we've come in 13 years and here we are as a national organization that has been inspired by, by those words. Um, we have 130,000 what we call Spartan members and 25 chapters all across the US. Um, and really at the end of the day, what we're here to do is we invest um, in our veterans. We provide personal development opportunities so that our veterans, they feel empowered, they feel trained and equipped to be able to be a value and to be leaders within their own communities, really going out there and living those words that Travis spoke, if not me, then who? Thank you, Amy. That's, that's a great story. It's great to hear that. Uh, Mike, you wanna go next? Absolutely. Uh, well, again, great to be here and great to be able to spend a little time leading in the Veterans Day talking about Team Red, White and Blue. So uh, you know, we were founded in 2010. I actually finished up my third deployment uh, as an intelligence officer and uh, then went to grad school at the University of Michigan. And I found 
myself uh, lacking all the structure of the military because I was technically still in, I was a captain, but I didn't have a unit to report to and all that. But I still had a job, I still had a salary, I still had healthcare. I remember thinking to myself like, how would, would this go if I didn't have any of those things, right? To include all the structure, the daily physical activity uh, and physical training that you do when you're in the military. And so um, that really is where the idea began because I was studying positive psychology. I knew that, you know, the number one driver of life satisfaction is the quality of your relationships with people. And so we started out by building chapters uh, in, in pockets of the country. And really we were centered around trying to help veterans to meet fellow veterans, but also uh, civilian supporters there to help them to reintegrate with that process that I described myself struggling with. And a big part of what we did was physical activity. So we were running triathlons, CrossFit, yoga, uh, and we found a lot of veterans starting to come out of the woodwork saying, hey, like physical activity, like saved my life. It was huge for me when I left the military and, you know, I put on uh, the, all this weight because I stopped working out and then I rediscovered the power of running. And uh, we just began to grow like through that. And so our organization's mission is to enrich veterans' lives. And you know, we are really uh, evolving in this direction of uh, forging America's leading veteran health and wellness community. Uh, 192 chapters, 235,000 members, 70% uh, of them veterans and 30% uh, of them non-veterans. And, and so we found this great mixture uh, of people across our organization where veterans are helping to inspire fellow veterans and, and civilians in, in their chapter and in the organization. And then vice versa, right? So it's creating this incredible ecosystem of support and positive energy. Thanks, Mike. Great story. Um, Art, can you tell us about Team Rubicon? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I hear a lot of the numbers from Mike and Amy here, and I, I think Team Rubicon's a little similar. You know, we've approached 10 years. Uh, we had our 10-year anniversary earlier this year, and we were founded after the earthquake in 2010. Um, and since that time, the eight initial deployers have grown to about 137,000 volunteers spread across the country. And our mission is to serve communities by mobilizing the veterans to continue their service by leveraging their skills and experiences. And it's really about helping communities prepare, respond, and recover. And it's the same communities that these veterans live in and are part of. And like Mike, we're about 70% uh, military veterans in composition. Uh, we also have first responders and civilians that have joined the team. You know, we like to say that, you know, our members are built to serve and, you know, these veterans, first responders, and, you know, what we endear them as, as gray shirts go into these communities and in serving, they actually find um, some of the well-being and empowerment that really allows them to, to thrive in the civilian environment. So we couldn't be happier to join this panel and, and contribute to this story of, you know, civic engagement. Thank you all very much. I mean, I think that um, if I were uh, an observer of this panel and I just heard about your organizations, I would be a little surprised. If I had come to as a funder to a panel about veteran nonprofit organizations, I would have expected to hear much of the kind of regular drumbeat, which sounds very much like you know, our wounded veterans, our wounded warriors, they need help. Um, there's a suicide problem, et cetera. Can you guys each talk a little bit about this idea of veterans as civic leaders? And, and, um, and tell us, how did we get to this place of a narrative where veterans are labeled as broken? Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and how are they assets instead of um, uh, just charity cases? So Mike, why don't you kick us off? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think that, um you know, it's a great question and one, one that we think about a lot because we do know, right, that there, you know, are some veterans out there that really do struggle and, and, um, and face lots of challenges, be they physical injuries, you know, or challenges psychologically. Um, but what we also know is that a majority of veterans have been forged in the fire of their experience. They have, uh, through combat deployments, and, and even if they didn't deploy just through training, uh, it develops within you a sense of resilience. Uh, and from day one that you join the military, a sense of being a leader. Right, you're immediately following instructions and you're learning how to follow and then you're learning how to lead. And we all know, of course, right, like the idea of if my squad leader gets shot, um, injured or wounded, like next person up, right? There's this constant mindset of uh, focusing on leadership and, and you just live in it and you get so used to it. It's like breathing the air that, you know, that you breathe. And so, you know, I think that uh, the narrative uh, took hold, Marcus, a lot you know, by a lot of the focus, right? Uh, we all know that Right. Uh, people you know, talk about like, you know, going to a NASCAR race to look for the crashes, you know, like there's very often people will write about and will profile 
uh, the examples of people who are really struggling. Uh, and it just doesn't gain as much um, focus or gain as much traction, you know, in, in the media or in social media or anywhere uh, when you're talking about things going well and veterans as assets and as leaders as much as when they're struggling. Thanks, Mike. It's really helpful. Um, Amy, you know, how do you kind of square what is uh, an all too kind of prevalent narrative of a broken veteran as compared to those that, that you guys serve and that you leverage uh, in, in your organization? Yeah, I think, you know, Mike, bring, Mike brings up a great point just talking about how, you know, you do see the differences out there. There are certainly some veterans that are struggling and, and managing some immediate acute needs that have to be handled. Um, and then I think that there are some veterans that are out there that really want to, you know, I think about when we first started at the beginning of the pandemic and none of us knew what to do with our programs because a lot of us thrive on this in-person connection. And it was really interesting to me to see how many people started picking up the phone and they just said, you know, what can I do to be of, to be of help? And, you know, immediately we realized, you know, there are so many people, especially our military veterans, who are really just kind of ingrained with this element of service. Um, they've been taught leadership, they've been taught integrity, many values and qualities that I think are really important um, just out in today's community. And I think kind of the work that each of our organizations are doing are actually providing that forum for them to be trained, to be developed, and, and really understand how to leverage those strengths and really go out and make an impact. And I think when you start to see those out there taking action and really living by what they believe in, I think then you will start to see some of the narrative shift. And the other, you know, many of our groups um, that are on here, a lot of our community-based organizations, we incorporate the civilian community to work in conjunction, hand in hand, side by side, shoulder to shoulder with our veterans. And I think having those two groups come together and really understand what each other bring to the table, I think is incredibly important in starting to shift that narrative to more of a positive narrative. Uh, that's, a, that's a great point, Amy. I mean, the, the, the fact that we can leverage veterans and frankly, when they get back into service again and, and back with other veterans, some of those issues are being resolved through that, that care. So I think that's, that's fascinating. Um, Art, give us a sense of uh, same question on team, on team Rubicon. How about the veterans that are, are volunteering with you? Um, how are you seeing you know, a different narrative than what maybe the general public sees about veterans? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, in listening to, to Amy and Mike, I think one of the things is, right, we have an obligation to tell the story in a different way. And lots of times it's a story of a, a citizen, you know, a civilian that happens to be a veteran that's engaged in civic engagement. You know, lots of times the story that surfaces is the one, you know, Mike articulated that stereotype of the broken veteran. We've had a lot of incredible, you know, realizations as our veterans come that it's really, you know, they're, they're built to serve, they're given an opportunity to connect with, you know, using the skills that they've had and having impact in the community. And that's really where the recognition comes. You know, we've talked to uh, advisors, some of them who were um, venture capitalists, you know, and their, their cut on it was, you know, think about this. You have, you know, now 18 million veterans that returned from service, the 4 million or so that returned from post 9-11, and we asked nothing of them. You know, it's this incredible civic asset that we haven't asked to use, but they're still there. They still want to plug in. They still want to go out there. We know from statistics that they're more apt to vote. They're more engaged civically. Um, so they're there and they're just ready to serve. Team Rubicon now becomes a vehicle in those moments of recovery necessitated by disaster where we can connect their desire with the process to help, you know, communities recover. So I think it's it's connection, it's storytelling, and it's again, I think part of what you just mentioned or what you mentioned earlier about breaking the stereotype. Thanks, Art. I mean, I, so what I'm hearing is, you know, we can't just deny that, you know, that there is a problem, right? We have a veteran suicide epidemic, and um, part of that problem is is definitely fed by uh, a narrative that paints veterans on and on as broken, and as opposed to what you guys are really pushing against that and saying, no, veterans, you have so much to bring to the table. Your service doesn't end when you take the uniform off. And I think I've heard stories from each of your organizations of how your programming, a veteran volunteering and, and coming out and saying, I'm, I'm ready to serve, gets them through from a well-being standpoint to a much better place. So 
I think that's so important that we begin to right size the narrative about our community uh, and begin to tell the appropriate stories. I thank you guys all for, for touching on that. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges you faced. You know, every one of your organizations now has been running your model for um, close to a decade, if not over a decade now. And you've definitely iterated. I don't think anybody is exactly what they started as, right? So I guess um, maybe uh, Mike, you can kick us off, but tell us a little bit about you know how you started and then how you've iterated and what Team Red, White, and Blue has kind of become over the last ten years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think that if you're doing the exact same thing in, in year ten as you're doing in year one, that'd be a problem, uh, right? So just evolving and sort of listening to uh, the marketplace, so to speak. I mean, I remember in our very early days, like, we didn't necessarily know that physical activity was going to be the crux of, of what we did. Um, it was really around helping connect veterans to their community. And we started listening to veterans saying, yes, more and more, like we want to be a part of an organization that embodies physical activity. Like, yes, when we were in the military, we were doing it, but we had to wake up really early to do it. We had to do a lot of exercises we didn't want to do. And now I want to find things that are, are more in line with my passion, be it yoga, CrossFit, hiking, rock climbing or whatever. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, we have evolved Marcus in the biggest way in terms of starting out by going regionally. So we went to this, built this model that is very regional and we had I think seven or eight regional directors um, by I think 2015 or 16, um, you know, and, you know, in that process, one of the things that, you know, we learned is that, yes, you need to be able to put leadership down to, you know, closer to the ground level. Um, but ultimately for us, what we learned is that the chapter model is not scalable for us. Um, you know, you get to a certain point where there's so many volunteer leaders and we have 1900 of them, what we call Eagle leaders that are, have a team rdbb.org email account, things like that. Right. Uh, and even though they're not employees, even get a stipend, you, they still require management. They still require development and training and leadership. And that's tough. And so, you know, a big part of how we're evolving is, you know, harnessing the power of, of technology, which of course is a double-edged sword, but, you know, over the past two years, we developed an app and that app now puts the hands, the power in the hands of, of any member in our organization to create a physical activity event wherever they're at. And then you can go into that app. And if you're a veteran or you join the organization, you can find and you can discover uh, opportunities to go connect and do a functional fitness workout or a run at a park or whatever it might be um, via that app. So we're trying to make it so that members can connect with each other, not needing all of the leadership hierarchy. So we're just trying to, again, be as nimble as possible. Uh, the other thing that we've evolved on, you know, is just our, our view on uh, the role of national events and like the, what I call big team RWB, like the entire organization. Cause there's a lot of members that can't make it out to a chapter event or they don't want to, right? Uh, they don't have the time. I'm sure you hear similar things from Amy and Art on like, there's just different people in different chapters of life with different bandwidth. And, you know, we want to engage as many of our members as possible. And so um, you can participate, you know, just twice a year, maybe you do wide for warriors on veterans day, you know, and you do uh, the 1776 challenge right in June and July. Uh, but it's really trying to create as many opportunities to allow people to pick and choose because people do want to have that flexibility. They don't want to be told it's either this or that and that's it. Uh, and so we've worked really hard at trying to give this uh, expanding menu of ways that veterans can engage with our organization. Thanks, Mike. That's, that's great. Um, Art, can you tell us a little bit about or talk a little bit about um, Rubicon and, and the way that you guys have iterated your model? How, you, how have you grown over the years and gotten past some of the challenges you face? Yeah, so, you know, Team Rubicon has evolved, right? And, and our hope is that we don't miss any opportunities to make those strategic changes as we move forward. And the first real strategic change came for us when, you know, there was this realization that act, actually through performing this service of disaster recovery, we weren't just having veterans serve, we were serving veterans. You know, you articulated early that it's about maintenance of well-being. You know, so they're professional organizations and amazing organizations that serve veterans that come back with these wounds, you know, get them up and running. And we view it as our obligation. It really became apparent that, you know, we're delivering a service by enabling veterans to serve communities. So we maintain the well-being. You know, the next kind of challenge was, you know, taking the organization and beginning to professionalize it in a manner where we're recognized in the broader um, community. Uh, from adoption of, you know, national policies and standards to communications, you know, with the government to, you know, really kind of focusing on these inputs, outcomes and impacts that we'd have, you know, from measurement and evaluation to, you know, delivery of service, all of those things became really important. And then after Hurricane Harvey, 
you know, we really saw a transition and that we decided we could have more impact with the right resourcing um, across that disaster circle where we respond right after a disaster and muck out a house or remove debris. We decided that we could actually extend our services into recovery to get people back into their homes, uh, which we've had up till this point. And, you know, I think, you know, as we look back, if you were to ask me this question, you know, five or 10 years from now, I personally believe that, you know, 2020 in the face of COVID uh, will be a, an example of how organizations, you know, find opportunity in crisis. Um, so that's really been our, our biggest uh, example. And we can articulate some of those, those points later on. But, you know, right now is one of those moments where I think as, an, as a uh, community serving veterans, you know, we have an incredible opportunity to capture more, more impact. It's good to hear, Art. I mean, a couple of record hurricane seasons, right, have definitely uh, been that crisis for you guys to launch into to more engagement. So, um, uh, Amy, I remember you telling me, you know, the Travis Manning Foundation initially launched um, without the vision it currently has, right? How did you guys grow into and, and defeat challenges to get to where you are today, creating a cohort of veteran leaders all over the country, getting them into schools, teaching, et cetera? Love to hear that. Yeah, I, you know, I think when we first, you know, initially started the organization, it was really interesting because I, I remember I've been with the organization for nine years now. So, and I started out as a volunteer myself. So it's been interesting to see the growth and, um, you know, encounter all the, the hurdles and the obstacles, which I actually think have made us stronger um, as we continue to grow and develop. You know, when we started, we the needs of the veteran community were very different. You know, we were focused initially very early on on um, career and transition support. Um, we had, you know, four very simple programs, but they didn't have any kind of a connection of up to how they were providing that support to the veteran, not only on a, a, a long-term impact, um, but also on the short term as well. So as we've evolved over the years and we recognize the value of, you know, relationships, finding a new sense of purpose after getting out of the military and also giving people an opportunity, our veterans to, to be of value in their own communities. You know, over the years, we've really crafted this nice, nice model where now, you know, we train them, we provide them these resources, they then take those opportunities to go out and, and be of value, whether that's through mentorship, whether that's through leading other veterans in their communities, and whether that's through going out and, and doing community service. You know, I think it's taken us a long time. And like, like Art mentioned, you know, we had to take the time to really evaluate um, what was the right way to go about this? What were the needs of the community? And now I see, you know, more than ever the last several years, the challenges have really been around um, mental health and well being. And, you know, you see suicide numbers rising within the veteran community and even just as a in the nation as a whole. You know, those are challenges that we all face. And I think the model that we've developed has been a nice way for us to engage the veteran community, shift the narrative, provide them those opportunities to feel empowered. You know, it's not about going out there and having someone help you. It's almost like you have to learn how to teach and train yourself to be of more value. And I think that's really the model that we've taken that's been a value in helping improve the overall mental health and well being of our veteran community. Thank you, Amy. It's it's amazing to see that evolution uh, of, of program focus over the years. Um, so, I mean, I think that what I've definitely heard as a common thread for all of these organizations is you guys have you've seen the need of the veteran, and you've also seen the opportunity to leverage their experience and their skills to continue serving their communities. And through that, you create a constant thread of well-being over time as you engage your, your constituents, your veterans, and your communities. And I think that's incredibly important um, just to note and to really distill out here. But I do want to touch uh, on something that uh, Sean uh, Riley from Philanthropy Roundtable wrote an article uh, a few months ago about using veterans uh, as, as civic components in our country. And he talked about how the American Legion many, many years ago, uh, that was one of their main main roles, right? The American Legion had literally baseball that they oversaw for most of the country. These are veterans that came back from World War II and went right back into work, into serving and teaching civics and things of that nature in their, in their communities. Um, you know, how can we take this younger generation of veterans, which, 
you know, we talk about a millennial generation that now has sustained the longest sustained conflict in our nation's history with an all volunteer force. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible when you really step back and say, we're almost 20 years into this war. We've never had a draft. Um, and all volunteers have continued to step up. There's a whole lot of goodwill uh, to be captured and leveraged within that. So, uh, Art, let me start with you. I mean, knowing that this is really the veteran community's roots, how do we as a veteran nonprofit community, as funders in this space, how do we make an impact to get veterans back to what, what they're best at? Yeah, Marcus, I think it's a, a wonderful question. And, you know, I'll kind of circle back to this, this idea that, you know, in crisis comes opportunity. And I think COVID has proven that, you know, if we dissect what you said, which was, you know, back from World War II and what we'd done, one of the things we found with COVID in particular in, in our line and serving after disasters is a lot of the demographics got cut out of the volunteer population. They became at high risk, that big population that was from Vietnam or World War II now can no longer go into the field. So to answer your question, I think one of the really, really important things is to provide these opportunities for engagement. Our organization went through an entire pivot on March 16th, you know, right after we'd locked down the organization and COVID. And we said, you know, how does Team Rubicon not just survive COVID? How do we thrive in it? And the answer was in the veterans we had, the diverse set of skills they had, their leadership that Mike talked about, you know, their, their you know, just sim simple willingness to serve. And we found these gaps in, the, in society that we were able to fill. You know, we launched testing sites to, you know, I think we've tested over 80,000 people. We filled the gap for delivery of food, um, for food insecurity. I think we've, uh, you know, driven over 122,000 miles, prepared almost 10 million meals, you know, moved almost 50 million pounds of food to meet that insecurity. And we've also stood up some of those, those skills that the veterans had in particular um, for medical services. And we've found that, you know, in, impoverished communities or those most in need, such as the Navajo Nation, we were able to take those skill sets and plug them in. And I think, I think one of the, the neat things about the chemistry of, of uh, you know, going into communities with veterans is you create awareness. You're colliding with a civilian population, you know, and it becomes this opportunity for storytelling and connection that frankly, I think sometimes we've lost. And that's allowed, you know, we allow these other mediums to, to paint this picture of, you know, the military veteran and, and people get to see it firsthand. You know, the veterans that volunteer get to see the value of their civic engagement. And I think once they get a taste of it, once they get a taste of being an expert in preparedness or readiness or delivery of services, you know, they get this sense of fulfillment and they're going to come back and continue to do it. And those, those uh, constant... Uh, those feelings will continue to thrive and the connections will grow stronger. And I think we begin to shift this narrative and provide opportunity that the nation really needs at this point in time. That's, that's awesome, Art. Thank you. Um, Amy, I, I want to take kind of a similar question to you. Your organization, a little bit more focused actually on kind of the younger generation and in, in, in K through 12 schools. I think a lot of um, a lot of foundations right now fund in K-12 and have serious concerns about uh, various K-12 initiatives and where our education system is. You know, how do we kind of like Sean um, recommended in his article, how do we leverage that veteran powerhouse of experience uh, and character and bring it to bear on our education system, which needs help? Yeah, I, you know, I think we have, you know, had to pivot as, as Art just mentioned, you know, I think the example of COVID has been, you know, the, the make or break of what's next for all of our organizations. And when I think about what we've done at the Travis Manion Foundation, you know, a keystone effort of ours is really about veteran mentors going out and educating and inspiring youth um, to understand what their values are, what are their strengths, and how do you actually leverage those um, to be of impact? Whether you choose to serve in the military or not, that's not really the point of what they're teaching, but they're leveraging their experiences, the lessons that they've learned, um, how they've been able to train themselves to be diligent, to be of value, 
and, and to really go out and make a difference. And I think that's such a narrative that is needed, especially in our younger generations. And, you know, we've, we've worked with schools in various counties across the countries and really adapting and trying to, you know, adjust the way that we deliver this program, providing met veteran mentors in a way that kind of accommodate this hybrid and virtual environment. And I will say, you know, it's, it, in March, um, you know, we started off with a, what we called a character isn't canceled because it felt like everything else in the nation was getting canceled. And we continued to share those stories. Um, you know, we highlighted them through our social media outlets, um, all across the different news about how veterans really wanted to step up and play a role when parents and students were stuck at home and they didn't really have a lot of knowledge or expertise around homeschooling. And they also, wanted to teach them about, hey, this is a tough time and veterans can really inspire you with the resilience and the training that they've learned to take this, learn from it and go out and do something positive with that. And I think if we can continue to help and accommodate the needs that are out there as our school systems are changing in, in, in this unique environment, I think demonstrating the value that the veterans bring to that, I think will be huge as we continue to shift this narrative and tell the stories of them being assets and civic leaders by educating and inspiring those next generation. Now, it's awesome to see those programs. And I think in many ways, uh, Travis Manion Foundation, you guys have answered the call on Sean's, uh, on Sean's uh, article, right? Um, you know, enlist veterans as civic assets and, and, and into that, that civic education piece. So it's a great program. Um, Mike, g give us a sense of what a Team RWB chapter or what a, a, a lone eagle, if you will, anywhere in this country, um, if they're benefiting from your programming and they are back engaged, you know, what does that mean? What is the, what is the net effect of that in their local community? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I think that a couple of things, um, you know, I think, first of all, you know, we talk about the importance of the, the health, mental, physical, emotional, right? Um, you've got to be able to take care of yourself first before you can really be an asset to other people. Um, so that's an important part, a, a driving part of our narrative is letting veterans know that, hey, if you're going to be a good leader for your family, in your community, in your job, wherever it might be, part of this is certainly looking out and making sure that you're getting in that those 10,000 steps a day, that physical activity is, is a big part of it. Um, and it's very easy, as we see, no matter who you are, how busy you get to be able to let that stuff go. Um, you know, I think a veteran who's well connected, who is uh, physically, mentally and emotionally healthy uh, in chapters, uh, you know, it has this ripple effect beyond certainly their team red, white and blue chapter and it carries over into all kinds of interactions throughout their community. And then of course on the social media, let's, let's be honest, like right, people on social media and they're not doing well, or they're struggling, they, they can cast stones uh, that, 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 you know, go half a world away. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. I, I like the, the direction of this conversation, Marcus, and, and the, I did read that article that Sean wrote, you know, I think that when I look at the data or the predictive analysis, right, that 50% uh, of American society is predicted to be obese or morbidly obese by 2030, as we look at the information age um, and how uh, uh, technology continues engineering physical activity out of life, uh, you have to be more and more intentional as each year goes by to be physically active. And so I see there being a big opportunity over time for Team Red, White, and Blue to play a leadership role to tackle this, what is a lot of people have clearly identified as a threat to our national security because we can't get enough people to be able to enlist in the military, but also the cost uh, and the strain on our healthcare system that comes from poor physical and then mental health. Um, you know, to me, when I think about civic education, there's certainly the formal route. So I played American Legion baseball. Um, you know, I played on a team sponsored by the VFW post, um, right? Um, they didn't necessarily come down and like do civic education per se, but what it was, was a conversation, right? It was a discussion. Sometimes you would see a veteran, hey, I'm a proud supporter of this team. Uh, and for me, I think what we just need to increase is the volume and the depth of the interaction between our youth in our country today and veterans. And obviously, Travis Manning Foundation doing a great job going into schools and, and doing that in a structured way. And I see the opportunity for Team Red, White, and Blue whether or not it's a formal program, um, you know, where, where we are coaching kids uh, on physical activity or things like that is, if nothing else, we need to be pushing our veterans to be out there in the community more and, and to step up and to lead more and to inspire that future generation, not just to be able to, you know, consider serving in the military themselves, but whatever they go on and do in life, that they be 
people who are, are adding strength and adding, um, you know, positive energy to the system, not detracting from it. Uh, that's a great point, Mike. I mean, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left here. And um, again, if anybody watching the panel has got any questions, please, please feel free to uh, put those in the chat box below. But I, I think to, to dovetail on what Mike just started on, um, I think it was a Coolidge quote, um, you know, a nation which forgets its defenders will itself be forgotten. And I think some of that burden as a nation to remember our defenders, to remember our veterans, definitely falls on our community. I think the veteran community uh, too often wants to say, I did my time, now I'm going to go hide away and, and kind of do my own thing. So all of you and all of your organizations clearly are calling veterans back out. Um, and putting them kind of in their rightful place. And, and so uh, I want to I wanna go to Art. Art, can, can you give us, you know, maybe an example of how, you know, a veteran who maybe took that leap and came out, um, what does it do for them? But also, how does that net out uh, to, to when they go back home? You know, if they come out to a disaster, what do they take back with them and, and how do they leverage it? Yeah, I think, you know, the big things, and, and we've had a lot of, you know, after action surveys that have quantified, you know, what happens to a veteran that, you know, decides to take the leap of faith, hop in an airplane, fly across the country and help someone in a community they're not familiar with. You know, it's really about community, identity and purpose. Those are the three things that, you know, everyone says we deliver. They they end up side by side with the men and, men and women, regardless of service, you know, that they've been with before. So there's this familiarity and there's this community that happens. You know, they put on a gray shirt and as simple as it may be, or it might be, you know, Mike's team, RWB shirt, whatever it is. And, and now you have identity out of that. And really what we deliver is this sense of, of purpose and mission. It's so clear cut when you walk into a disaster um, zone and you're you're just simply helping people get up on their back up on their feet and that purpose that fulfillment of that natural calling that you're built to serve I mean shoot they all raise their hand and join voluntarily um, we get to reunite uh, at that point in time and you know ideally you know that experience delivers to the veteran that goes with us you know maintenance of well-being the sense of accomplishment community and when they return home our hope is that it makes you know, their life and the interactions they have, be it with their family, with the people that they work with, you know, with their, their peers, you know, it gives an understanding. A great example are, you know, we've had veterans that have been supported by their companies through their uh, veteran employee resource groups. They'll fly out, get all of those feelings, go back, and, and suddenly now it's a conversation about the positives of the veteran. Well, I should have known you were a veteran, you know, as you articulate this story of, of taking 12 people who'd never mucked out a house before and organizing them and delivering this incredible service, it makes complete sense. You know, so all of these positive attributes really begin to, to come to the forefront. You know, we, I was listening to uh, something our chief medical officer had actually said in an interview yesterday that really switched my mind on a lot of the topics we covered. And he said, think of it this way, you know, a veteran doesn't separate from the service, a veteran graduates from the service because it's just like going to a, a school or going to a university, whatever it might be. And, and now you're actually, your mind is switched on to thinking about those unique attributes that because of that experience they now have and can deliver and utilize and leverage to have greater impact on themselves, the communities they serve and the people they interact with. So I think it's a really, you know, powerful opportunity across you know, all of these organizations. The other thing I'd say is, you know, if, if our volunteers open up their closet and they see a red shirt and they're choosing between a Team Rubicon shirt or an RWB shirt, I just hope they grab one of those shirts and get out there and, and do what they need to do. Because again, it's, it's as Amy articulated, it's, I know I need to help myself. And if I can help myself, I can be, you know, my best, best military veteran as I, I go out into the world and do good. Yeah, no, thanks. Art. It's so good. And we know that there is such a great benefit to the veteran themselves, but to, to actually be able to measure that some, you guys have done that. RWB's done the, the Enriched Life Scale, which is, it really puts to paper what's seen. That's amazing. So a Amy, I want to ask you a question and then one more for Mike, but Amy, um, uh, I have so much respect and admiration for you. You know, you lost your husband, um, was killed in combat. You 
have volunteered again. We, we know as veterans that it's not the service member alone that serves. You volunteered again to continue to engage with this community. And um, I think that it's just so admirable and honorable of you. Can you tell us what does the military family community um, mean? I mean, all of that coming together, it's not veterans alone. Can, can you just talk a little bit about why you feel this sense of responsibility and duty to continue to serve? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that, Marcus. I appreciate that. Um, it certainly isn't easy. You know, I, I now I'm 10 years out after my loss and, you know, I'm remarried and I have a daughter. So my life is very different. Um, but what really, really pushed me and kept me moving forward was the fact of this element that, you know, my late husband was a Navy SEAL. And I knew that, you know, the things that inspired him were service before self, you know, putting on that uniform and being of value. He really stood behind what he, you know, he gave 110% in everything that he did. And I really wanted to embody the way that he, he lived his life, the values that he um, inspired me by. And I remember very soon after his loss, um, I was at a, like a, a workshop and you know, someone had given me the information and said, you know, here's a box of tissues and it's okay if you want to cry every single day for the rest of your life. And it was that pivotal moment for me that I realized that, you know, at TMF, we work with Gold Star families, survivors and, and the veteran population. And I realized there was so much alignment in that ability to want to continue pushing on and you wanted to continue serving because I felt like if it was important to Brendan, then it would be something that would continue to help propel and push me forward. Um, and I didn't want to sit around and cry. And I, and I don't want to discount because that's certainly an important part of the healing process. But then there's always that, that, that avenue that says, what's next? And I felt having these opportunities to feel empowered, having these opportunities. Um, and like I said, I started out at the foundation as a volunteer, getting behind something that gave me a sense of purpose. Um, like you brought up, Marcus, you know, the military community was something important, but after my husband died, I didn't really feel like I had that connection with the military anymore. So for me, I felt like I had to go out and find a new community and a new family to really help me um, advance in the next steps and the future aspirations that I had. And I, and I see that in a lot of the Gold Star families and a lot of the veterans that we continue to serve. And I think building yourself up to be better and to be stronger can only not only value you in the end, but also shows what you can do for others and be of value to your community. Wow, Amy, you're an inspiration. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. It truly is uh, remarkable what you guys are doing. Um, our last two minutes, Mike, uh, real quick, uh, you know, it's Veterans Day tomorrow. Um, what can we all do uh, to, to honor that as a holiday? Uh, what can we do to really kind of engage in, in, as a holistic community? Yeah. Well, first of all, just going back to real briefly on your other comment that you teed up, there was some great words that came from General Wainwright uh, that he proclaimed uh, to every discharged soldier from World War II about challenging them to go back and be a leader. So uh, clearly all three of our organizations have really embodied that and taken on that challenge all these years later. Uh, you know, when it comes down to Veterans Day, you know, I talk about it a lot, but typically, even in, not in this COVID year, it's parades and discounts at, at restaurants, right? That's what people think of as being ways to express gratitude. And of course, both of those things are, are great. They're admirable uh, to me. Uh, you know, I think it's really about going beyond that. You know, do you know someone who served? Pick up the phone and call them. Thank them. Even a text message, uh, that, that's pretty powerful. Uh, in our organization, of course, you know, we do Wad for Warriors. It's really challenging workout. Um, and I think what better way than to go down to your local gym or even out there by yourself and do something really hard like a workout um, you know to uh, to pay tribute to the sacrifice and the service that the 18 million living and all the ones before you know um, made on behalf of the country I think there's something really symbolically powerful about doing something uh, that's physically demanding and challenging and the sense of accomplishment you get when you complete that and especially if you do that uh, alongside someone who's served, it's a pretty powerful moment. And so that's what we do as an organization, but certainly lots of ways you can do, go out there and you know, uh, support by uh, going out to restaurants and doing that stuff as well. I just think it's, if you can find a more powerful way like our organizations offer, then that I think is gonna be a better route. That's awesome. Well, well thank you guys. I think uh, it's loud and clear um, from this panel that uh, you know, for those listening, you want to, you want to support your veteran. Uh, number one, expect things from them. Uh, let's let's not continue to pity 
uh, and and just just kind of be downtrodden with charity uh, onto our veteran population. Let's expect things of them. They they have um, a great amount of skills and experience to be leveraged. Our country needs them. Uh, and frankly, it's better for them when they get engaged in their communities. So I think that's a resounding uh, takeaway from today. And uh, I hope everyone listening will consider um, looking at these, looking more into these organizations and finding out more about the veteran nonprofit community. Uh, so thank you everybody for listening. Thanks for all our panelists. It's a great conversation. And I'm gonna send it back to Catherine. Marcus, thank you so much for moderating this session. Um, Art, Amy, Mike, you guys are truly inspirations. The quote uh, that Travis Minion said, if not me, then who? I mean, what a powerful statement for all of us to lean into. And Art, I really appreciated the mission of Team Rubicon of community identity and purpose. And so much of um, what each is doing, uh, whether it's through leadership development, teaching in schools, health and wellness, or responding and offering recovery support to those experiencing disaster or human humanitarian crises, y'all are doing incredible things. So thank you for demonstrating civics in action uh, with our veterans.